For any who don't know me, I'm John Rantel. I'm the Bishop of the Southern Region in Anglican Church of Southern Queensland. And it's a delight to welcome so many of you here this afternoon or this morning, depending on your time zone. And it's going to be my absolute pleasure in just a moment to introduce Sam Wells. But I just want to make sure people know how they're moving through the Zoom tonight. Uh, so we've talked about the mute and turn it, perhaps turning your screen off if you don't want to be caught uh, on, on being recorded. But also we do want people's interaction. And the way to do that is because we, we've got moderators who are viewing the different screens because there are so many of us here. And also we encourage you to use the chat and as well to use the kind of the, the reactions button at the bottom of, of the Zoom. So that's one way in a sense to put your hand up to request to have some kind of input into the sessions. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Sam Wells. And um, I know that almost everyone here is going to know something about Sam, but I'm just going to run through a little bit just to reintroduce Sam to the Australian context. The Reverend Dr. Sam Wells is the vicar at St. Martin's in the Fields in London, and he's been there since 2012. Before that, he was in the US of A, uh, Carolina at Duke University, the Dean of Duke Chapel. And yet before that, Wikipedia tells me he spent 10 years in parishes where there were disadvantage, but Wikipedia doesn't tell me which parishes. But I'm always pleased to know that those parishes do seem to pop up in Sam's writings and they get good representation there. Sam was out in Australia last in 2019 with his wife, Bishop Joe Wells, helping us in Queensland with our clergy conference and if I remember rightly Sam was nipping down to Victoria to speak. Now doesn't 2019 seem like a world away but it's great that you're all here online and if you're ready I would like to before I hand over to Sam open up in prayer. So let us pray. Loving Father, you are with us at all times and in all places. As we together now, as summer evening draws in and winter morning begins, bless us in this time together. Help us to listen with eagerness, to ignore the distractions around us, and to be aware of your presence amongst us, and to be aware of one another, one another of us online. Bless Sam in his work and his endeavours, and each of us in our questions and responses. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Sam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Bishop John, and thank you so much to everybody for joining this call. I'm going to speak on the pandemic and the future shape of church. I'd like to speak about three things. I'm gonna start with the pandemic and the gospel. I'll move on to the pandemic and the church and I'll conclude with heart edge and the future shape of church. So the pandemic and the gospel. Questions about the virus, why it is here, what we do about it, how we balance public good with our own needs, how we survive, what we owe one another, how we can flourish, all of these are intensified versions of life's big questions. The way we tell the story of the virus is the way we tell the story of everything. There's two ways we can tell the story of the virus and everything, and I want to explore each of them with you just now. Here's story one. The universe began with a big bang. It took a few billion years for things to settle down. By a strange collection of circumstances, one planet in a minor galaxy developed the conditions for life to begin. In a ruthless and brutal sequence of visceral contests, these forms of life gradually became more sophisticated until they started to develop self-consciousness. They started to plan, refine, reflect, and make meaning. But such meaning had no larger purchase. It was simply their attempt to recognize and value those features of their existence that rose above their raw animal condition. Unsatisfied with the mundanity of things, these self-conscious beings started to put their existence in the context of something greater and more enduring. They talked of a life force that lay beyond the earth and their existence. 
they sought ways to communicate with this life force and discern its purpose. But these were in the end tragic ways of failing to come to terms with their accidental purposeless lives. In truth, the only value they reliably found was the sense of achievement in asserting themselves over one another and the sense of belonging they felt when they knew they were appreciated. Everything else in life was a conspiracy of busyness designed to keep hearts and minds so preoccupied with manageable projects that they would never reflect and despair at the pointlessness of it all. That's what I call story one. What I sense has been most deeply troubling about the pandemic is that it's laid bare story one in the rawness of its struggle for survival and the emptiness of its attempts to rise above that struggle and make meaning and purpose. The paraphernalia of a full and active life have been stripped away and there's now no shield from the uncompromising necessities of survival and the unrelenting approach of death. I say that with no pleasure because we all know story one very well and spend large parts of our lives in it. When we panic, feel the weight of anxiety closing in, sense despair or depression in our bones, story one seems to be the only story. That's not the pathology of a few, that's a regular reality for everyone. But I want to suggest a different way of telling the story. Story two goes like this. There's something called essence. It's outside, beyond, and largely incomprehensible to existence. It's made up of three persons in utter devoted and dynamic relation to one another. It dwells in forever, eternity, beyond time and space. It chose to create time, space, matter, shape, life, energy, consciousness, what together we call existence. It did so for one reason only, because it desired to be in relationship with something, someone outside itself. It created the universe and waited until the constituents for life had all come into focus. Since it's outside time, the odd 14 billion years were as a day. Once human beings had taken shape, relationship began to take on a different dimension. The Trinity, as we call the three persons, began to interact with human consciousness. Eventually, it settled upon one people, Israel, to be in covenant relationship. But the whole purpose of the story was that Trin the Trinity would become known and be in relationship with humanity and the creation in person. In the fullness of time, this happened. One person of the Trinity took human flesh as a member of the people of Israel. That person brought the entirety of humanity face to face with God and the entirety of God face to face with humanity. Yet the virus that had beset humanity from the beginning, the fatal flaw that poisoned existence, got to this relationship too. Humanity rejected the utter human, utter God, and killed him. And this is the crucial moment in the story. At this point, the Trinity might have abandoned the relationship. If the Trinity had left it there, there would be nothing, nothing at all, to stand against those who said that speculation and exploration of transcendence and meaning was just a tragic failure to come to terms with the limitations of existence, and in the end, sadder than the cynicism of mechanistic determinism. But the Trinity didn't leave it there. The Trinity kept the story going, kept the relationship going. The Trinity not only restored the second person to existence, but when that second person, Jesus, had restored relationships with those who panicked and fled, the third person, whom we call the Spirit, came to shape all the ways of people in all people in the ways Jesus had offered. And when existence finally comes to an end, not just for each one of us, but for all things, Jesus will be there again at the threshold of time and eternity, when our consciousness will be suffused by essence, and with the Trinity, we will finally be taken into the wonder of forever. That's story two. Jesus' resurrection comes at the moment that the whole story of everything could be lost. Those who are convinced there's no reason to think beyond or outside story one would be perfectly justified if it weren't for the resurrection. For without the resurrection, God would be like a beautiful sail on a ship that was nonetheless headed for the rocks. It's the resurrection, not the coronavirus, that changes everything. It's the resurrection that shows God will never give up on us. It's the resurrection that demonstrates that this relationship for which God created the universe and because of which Jesus died is finally, ultimately, eternally, unbreakable. The virus is a terrible thing, which has killed some, damaged many and impoverished almost everybody. But most of all, what it's done is to lay bare the difference between story one and story two. 
For story one, the virus is an intense, bleak and almost unbearable demonstration of what's finally true for us all, that we live short and troubled, incomplete lives with no abiding value or purpose. For story two, the virus is a truly scary example of what life could feel like if story two were not true. Mary turns round from the tomb to the risen Lord. She turns from death to life, from grief to restored relationship, from despair to the one who will finally never let us go. She turns from story one to story two. The offer of the gospel is that we do the same. Part two, the pandemic and the shape of church. I don't believe the pandemic has introduced any, any particular new theological truth, but I do believe it's been a refiner's fire that's revealed a number of dynamics that were previously much more hidden and that there are ways we can distinguish before COVID, BC, from after COVID, AC. AC, I see a humbler church with a bigger God. I want to explain what I mean by that. The French philosopher Michel de Certeau distinguishes between a strategy and a tactic. A strategy builds a citadel and from its control base makes forays into the hinterland. A tactic has no home base, nowhere to store its booty, and survives by hand-to-hand -hand encounters on the ground. I want to put these contrasting concepts to use with a broad distinction. Here are two familiar sentiments. Make me a channel of your peace, says the 1967 hymn, based on a prayer written in France in 1912 and widely though mistakenly attributed to St Francis. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. So says the 16th century Spanish mystic Teresa of Avila. I want to highlight what these two sentiments have in common. They assume what I'm going to call a strategy church. A strategy church makes two assumptions that I think are relevant to our BCAC dis discussion. The first is an unspoken sense <clears throat> that Jesus ascended before he'd actually finished his work amongst us and that therefore it falls to us, his beloved and chosen followers, to complete the work he was too busy or distracted to attend to. The second is that if one imagines an hourglass with the top and much larger part being heaven and the bottom and much smaller part being earthly existence and Jesus being the aperture through which the angels ascend and descend between the two, then we, more precisely the church, con currently constitute that aperture. The church is the principal and definitive way in which God continues to work in the world after the manner of Christ's incarnation. Now let me contrast this picture with what I'm going to call tactic church. Christ plays in 10,000 places, says the Jesuit Gerard Manley Hopkins, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. Notice how this tactic language differs from the assumptions of a strategy church. In this version, the church doesn't have to be a sort, the source from which all blessings flow. A colleague told me about three women who attended a church BC. The church had to shut for a few weeks for repairs. So the three women made a plan. One went to a car boot sales each Sunday morning, met and talked to the regulars, formed relationships and learned much. Another went to Sunday league football games and had a similar experience. <clears throat> a third went to an Ikea store and got to know staff and customers. After a few weeks, the three women compared notes <clears throat> and had enough information to become excited about what they were discovering and understanding. When the time came that the church reopened after the refit, they had a genuine quandary about whether to return or whether to continue in their explorations. One of them explained, our God is now too big to fit back into our church. What they were naming was their discovery of tactic church. Tactic church does not assume everything God is doing comes through the church. <clears throat> it doesn't assume the best example of God's ways is always the church. It rejoices to discover the surprises of what the spirit is doing in unexpected places through unheralded people. Tactic church entails a humbler church that apprehends a bigger God. What I'm describing imitates the transformation described in Second Isaiah. In exile, beleaguered and bereft, Israel learned that its God was a much bigger God, the God of the whole world. 
but it also learned that God was more than happy to use agents other than itself, such as Cyrus, who didn't even claim to know Israel's God. That's the discovery we now need to recall. The pandemic has so far, at least in the UK, had two key phases with different characteristics, each of which has proved a litmus test for the church. The first phase was a rapid collective confrontation with mortality, a culture that has largely succeeded in its project of denying, delaying and distracting from death suddenly had to face the prospect of mass mortality. While that prospect didn't fully materialize, the litmus test for the church was, is the church a reliable, gentle and trustworthy presence in the face of death? The final test of a friend is, would I want you beside me on my, on my deathbed? The point is not fundamentally about whether churches were open or not. It's about whether in the face of the world's preoccupations and the world church's obsessions, the church was able to show its true colors when the whole country was confronted with fear, isolation, grief, powerlessness, and despair. If so, it proved itself a true companion to the nation. If not, it failed at its moment of greatest possibility. The second phase, which we're still in, at least in the UK, is characterized by patience, confusion, and hardship. While the most important thing in ministry is to be with people in the most challenging moments of their lives, most of all as they face death, the most frequent calling of ministry is to be, in a, to be an abiding presence as people address over the long term problems that won't go away, situations for which there's no quick fix, and issues that leave them feeling powerless. Some of this ministry is exercised by simply paying sustained attention. Some again by entering with people deeper into the mystery than they could dare to go alone. Some again by re-narrating their experience as part of a larger story. Whichever it is, the key question remains, has the church proved itself over the last year to be a good companion in uncertain and troubling times, not eager to find a full solution or collude in the culture of anger and blame? When you've been through a crisis with someone, you may return to a previous level of relationship but you never forget what you discovered about that person and about your relationship in that intense time. What we're experiencing is not something that's primarily or fundamentally happening to the church. It's something that's almost uniquely happening to the whole world and the church's true colors are being revealed by whether it has been able to face the challenge on the one hand of mortality and on the other hand of extended uncertainty and dislocation. This should be the church's natural habitat. After all, death and resurrection are the epicenter of Christianity and Egypt and Babylon. The locations of extended discomfort and dislocation are the crucible of the Old Testament where God was made known like no other moment. If there's been anger and blame, it's arisen out of clergy and lay people's feelings of irrelevance and powerlessness feelings that no amount of home food delivery or frenetic online communication can alleviate. These feelings of irrelevance and powerlessness are not to be brushed aside or regarded as signs of immaturity. They can be a stimulus to rediscover a tactic church when the strategy church is no longer fit for purpose. We can put a lot of energy into taking church online and it can do a lot of good in reimagining and reevaluating what we do and why we can make education, board meetings, synods and international links so much cheaper, more nimble and less cumbersome by removing the labour of travel and hospitality. All of these things can change the shape of the church, <clears throat> but these changes are superficial if they're not grounded in a renewal of our calling to be with people facing mortality and living with uncertainty. Those who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world should find in us sure and certain hope of God's eternal changelessness. The transformation from being a strategy church to a tactic church isn't a downgrade, a downsize, or what's today euphemistically known as a restructure. <clears throat> its success isn't to be judged <clears throat> by, <clears throat> excuse me, the number of hits on YouTube or the quantity of column inches in the national press that no one reads anymore, but everyone still wants to be quoted in. Christianity isn't a popularity contest where getting a lot of retweets gets us nearer to the kingdom. It's an encounter with truth to the bottom of our souls and to the very heart of God. The pandemic has been a complete nightmare, 
but it can still be a gift if it restores our clarity about our core purpose, to be with people in the nighttime of their fear, with faith, hope and love in the God who in Christ heals our past and frees our future. And finally, Heart Edge and the Future Shape of Church. Heart Edge was founded in February 2017 on two theological principles. The first is that the people of God have tended to be closer to God in times of adversity than in periods of plenty. Recall when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were thrown bound in the fire in Daniel chapter 3. God is with them. There aren't three figures walking in the flames, there are four. This is what Christians call salvation. Jesus is with us in the fire. The destiny of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is settled not before they reach the fire by some stunt that makes them avoid the flames, nor is there any dramatic rescue from the flames. Their salvation takes place in the flames as they discover Emmanuel. God is with them in the flames. Our salvation is the same. Here's the bad news. God doesn't spare us from the fire. God doesn't rescue us from the fire. Here's the good news. God is with us in the fire. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. That's the gospel. I believe Daniel 3 is the single most important story for understanding the Old Testament and how it came to be written. The fire represents Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego aren't spared the fire nor rescued from the fire. They find they're with God in the fire. Somehow the fire is a fire not just for them, but for God too. The same is true for Israel in Babylon. Israel isn't spared exile. Israel isn't rescued from exile. Israel finds in exile that God's there too. The appearance of the fourth figure in the fire sums up the experience of exile for, for Israel. God is with us. That's salvation. Exile is the place Israel wrote down the Bible. Exile is the time Israel found it was closer to God than it had ever been in the promised land. Exile was the lens through which the early Christians came to understand Jesus' death. Jesus has his own fire, which we call the cross. Jesus isn't spared the cross. Jesus isn't rescued from the cross. Je Jesus is with God on the cross. The bonds of the Trinity are stretched to the limit, but not ultimately broken. When we see the cross, we see that God is with us, however, whatever, wherever, forever. This is our faith. So Heart Edge believes if we're experiencing adversity in our church life right now in Australia and the UK, this is precisely the time we expect God to be close to us like never before. The second Heart Edge principle is this. God gives the church everything it needs, but the church needs to be open to receiving that everything in the form God sends it, often those on the edge. We sometimes need help from one another to perceive where our abundant assets are truly to be found. Rather than bewail our scarcity, we need to sharpen our perceptions for the ways God is sending us abundance. Let me share a simple story. A priest took a wedding. It was a lively wedding as the groom brought in his brother on, on keyboard and a whole band to play, not just at the reception, but the wedding itself. Everyone had a wild time. Six weeks later, one Saturday, the priest was in a pickle. The organist said he couldn't play tomorrow or any more. So the priest pondered. She called the bridegroom from the wedding six weeks before and said, you know your brother? Turned out the brother was at a loose end on Sundays and was glad to play. He enjoyed it more than expected, and within a month, the whole band were there. You know the rest of the story. That priest only met God's abundance because in her scarcity, she realized the assets she had. The Holy Spirit was sending her that keyboard player, not just for her sake, but for his. Heart Edge is about churches realizing their assets in the light of God's abundance and about turning the lament about the demise of the strategy church into the joy at the growth of the tactic church. Jesus turns our sorrow into dancing. Join us and see how those we've pushed to the edge can become the heart. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. <clears throat> and put your heart at the cutting edge of what it means to be a Christian today. Join us and meet the God who in Christ made the edge the heart. 
and in the spirit constantly renews the heart through the edge. Thank you, Sam. That was fantastic. Um, for those who have joined since five o'clock, I just want to say our apologies. There was a glitch at the beginning which limited the number of people in this Zoom to 100. We fixed the glitch, which is why you're here with us. You might be keen to know there is going to be a recording of this Zoom, so you can catch up with what Sam said at the beginning later. It's uh, my kind of uh, slightly daunting responsibility to respond to Sam. And, uh, and I, I was kind of trying to think, because we've talked about this before, framing three or four or four or five, uh, you might say, contextual questions for us here in Australia with regards to what Sam said. And Sam, I've got these kind of questions. I don't know whether you want to reply to each one of them in turn or whether you would like me just to fire away five big questions. Are you going to ask me all 35 or, or is it um, a slightly smaller number? Five. Five? We might need to take them one at a time. Okay, let's do that. I won't remember five. <laughs> I can't, I don't go beyond three. Okay, let's see how we go. And if you don't get to all five in the time we've got, that's fine by me, because I'm sure others will pop these up. Do they all start with the same letter? Looking down at my notes, no. No, okay, if you're def definitely one at a time then. Well, first of all, just a comment to say a massive thank you for your presentation. I want to say, if I can, and uh, this is a personal comment really, you have at times reminded me of Tony Hancock, the, um, for those who don't know Tony Hancock, the great English uh, comedian of the 60s. What I've always loved about Tony's humour was it was so grounded in the everyday, but it, he then, in the space of half an hour, took you into lands of absurdity. I don't think you've taken us to lands of absurdity, Sam, but I think you've taken us from a grounded position to lands of hope. And I so tremendously enjoyed it. But it's that idea, you might say, of common ground that I just want to start with. And it's no surprise you've talked about the pandemic. And our, I want to say just here, our experience of the pandemic, and this is very difficult ground for a Queenslander to speak about, uh, our experience of the pandemic has been significantly different from that of the UK. Um, one of the critical things, I think, is at least from the UK, and obviously I've got family in the UK, is the whole experience of the second wave. And has the second wave, in a sense, illuminated new things for you? And has it, in a sense, revealed yet even more for the Church of England? And along with that, is there any sense, and I don't know whether anyone's got this here, the comparative ease at which Australia has coped with this tragedy, has it allowed, has it given us a sense of not being quite so ready to hear the things you've said? That was my first question. <clears throat> yes, well, uh, I mean, it, this sounds a bit Cassandra, but uh, this story isn't over yet, is it? And, and um, so the, so, you know, everyone was saying, isn't Sweden marvellous? They've you know, they believed in, in personal freedom and people have made their own arrangements. And now people aren't saying that Sweden's marvellous anymore. Uh, so it, there's been a lot of changes in the story. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled for my Australian friends who've had a very different experience. I, I'm thrilled to see uh, rugby matches where people turn up to watch, although I don't think anyone goes to see rugby matches in Australia anymore, but even if they can. But, um, it, you know, that, that's wonderful. Um, it's not over yet. Who knows what the, what the next chapter holds? So it's not really a time for patting anyone on the back uh, at the moment. The, the second thing to say is, as far as the second wave is concerned, I think it's shown me two things, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is why I guess I, I started the way I did with story one and story two because it's it's shown you know I've, I've written a lot about narrative theology and narrative ethics and things uh in my uh ministry but it, it's shown me the power of story almost more vividly than ever before 
our, our, our desperate need to know where we are in a story and and the sense of the the second wave if that's what you call it certainly in in england going back into lockdown at the beginning of january when the whole story was supposed to be that this was bad last march and april and may and then we we come and came out of it um it is just how much we live our life in stories and this is the sort of the, the second half of that is that i've never been aware before as a leader how much you know right at the center of my job was storytelling and helping people locate themselves in a story particularly at, at st martin's in a community we've lost 84 jobs to redundancy because of how badly this has affected our community um our business is a skeleton of what it used to be currently um and so the desperate need to uh yeah to locate ourselves within a story and I, I don't think that's um significantly different for australia and i guess that's what i was trying to do by talking about strategy strategy church and tactic church but also about talking about babylon and these key motifs and locations in the christian story but also to expand that notion of story to to incorporate the old testament you know tend, the christian story tends if it's treated too rapidly to be a, a simply a death and resurrection story which of course was kind of how the virus was treated last march april this is bad we're going to get out of it wiser build back better and that kind of thing it's a much more complex story than that if you take the whole christian story uh, clearly the death and resurrection of christ is the center of the story but by introducing Babylon, for example, and Egypt to a smaller extent, I guess I'm trying. I'm trying to show how uh, so much of faith is searching for God's hand in, in a story that, at face value, seems not to have a clear shape. Um, so, uh, the the contrast between the strategy church and the tactic church is the strategy church does have an inclination to try to squeeze the complexity of life into a relatively simple story uh, the tactic church i think is more comfortable uh, with more open-endedness around that story uh, albeit trusting that the, the the fundamental of the story is that god god is with us um so you know there's a few thoughts uh, uh, about about the shape of story and 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 how it applies to the pandemic i don't think that there hasn't been a time in my life i've been more aware of the role of locating ourselves in a story and and how how leaders and storytellers have uh, have have needed to revise their expectations you know boris johnson notoriously said we would have um kicked this uh, you know, kick this out by Easter. He didn't mean Easter 2021 when he said that. So, you know, that sense of to what extent we can retain trust in those who've who've told, you know, a very hopeful story because it was what people wanted to hear rather than it, well, because that was the story that was in front of them. Thank you. Are you you're OK, I'll head on to the next topic. Um, Please do. And maybe we just do two or so, because I think we should be getting to the kind of a facilitated discussion in a few minutes. One of the, obviously, the massive contextual issues is the fact that the Australian church, and I say fact, um, my opinion, the Australian church is one of the most polarised of Anglican churches around the world. And that's a, a tragedy, I think, for many of us in Australia. But that polarisation seems to me... Um, can have consequences. You know, we have, a, we have a national bishops meeting coming up in March, and we have our general synod coming up in July, and all these kind of issues about uh, our common life, about unity, about biblical orthodoxy, will all come to the fore. I, I actually want to, in a sense, ask you to just dig back into your time, because if I'm looking at your Wikipedia entry, you were in America when the ACNA was kind of coming to fore. If you don't mind my asking, you know, do you have any wisdom for us here? Um, and I, I'm just going to guess, I think sometimes it's hard in the middle of a battle to be tactical, we end up jumping back into strategy. Well, um, I, I think uh, 
that phrase that I coined at the beginning of the second section uh, of of the address this morning is is my mantra at the moment, which is a humbler church and a bigger God. Um, you know, sometimes the servants of the monarch jostle around as if they have the importance of the monarch, but actually they're only the servants of the monarch. And often the monarch turns out to be much humbler than the servants. Um, so before we anathematize one another and claim the ultimate truth for our position, uh, we need to be humble before the one who is the ultimate truth, who is always bigger than our petty disagreements. Um, and often we say the most um, abrasive things because we feel we are defending our monarch from slight or uh, scorn or um, derision. Uh, but actually I think the monarch can take it very often. What the monarch can't take is us claiming unique ability to express the monarch's wishes or character or heart. So that's why I talk about a humbler church that doesn't accord to itself uh, a, an absolute uh, hotline uh, to the monarch's current state of mind. Uh, and that recognizes that when the monarch came among us, it was, you know, it was in a manger in a stable. It was, it was crucified as a, a, an outcast. So that bigger God is a humbler God also. Um, and so when it comes to I, what I take to be most of the people on this call who are, who represent what, what I would call the broad church, um, the important thing in, in uh, relating to people who call themselves more conservative or who see themselves as more um, bound to what broad church people often think of as an inflexible dogmatic system. Um, the secret seems to me is not to say uh, to those they're often in debate with, you go too far, um, it's to say you don't go far enough. Um, your God is too small. Um, again, back to the phrase, a humbler church and a bigger God. So to take one area where I often find myself in tension, um, not wanting to um, create further tension for you guys than you've got because you've always got enough on your plate uh, as it is. Um, but like Carl